you might want to just play it safe and put it on everything, you know, like if you, if you feel really extreme and go, the way to uh, not miss this is to put it on everything, go with that theory. But um, remember the plus Cs, otherwise, that, that sort of comment. Here we go. Drop-ins, okay, I don't know how it times for you, how it works for you on your schedule, but uh, I'm looking at how many people put redemptions in. I made a comment last week, I sent out a how's everybody going now that you've done a few quizzes. Didn't seem to get anybody real concerned. That to me means you're not too concerned, you're, you're thinking you're on a good path. So I'm hoping that your redemptions are also being looked after because I can't see too many for the very first one. So keep them coming in. Remember, they do make a difference at the end. So A1 redemptions are due by the end of this week. If there's ever a technicality, you're not on campus, but you really wanted to get it in, scan it and send it to us. Scan it and send it to me or to Dave, whichever one, and we'll still do it. Okay? We'll still accept it as a redemption if there's a problem. Integration. Here we go. Round one. There is a rule in front of us. It's on the top of page 41. I want you to make a few n things stand out. Okay? It says that the it's called that he, Dave's called it a function of a function rule. So this can only apply though under one condition. Have a look at what's inside the bracket. What is inside the bracket? It says ax plus b. What is inside the bracket has to be linear. Linear means like, you know, y equals mx plus b, that sort of thing. You cannot have x squareds in there. It does not work. This rule does not work for anything except for, all right, a linear. So I will sort of put the word there, linear, because it means the x has a power of 1. It can only apply to something that is linear. So I'll, I'll put a little reminder, y equals mx plus b, all right. So you can see that the x has a power of 1. Now if you glance at your examples which are running down your page there, you can see the first example where about, or th that's done for us has got a 4x minus 7. It's linear. Have a look at what's under the square root in the next one. 3x plus 4. That is linear, what is under the square root. Have a look at the next one. In the cube root situation, it's got a 5 minus 7x. So you might want to highlight that each of those has got a plain x. It does not work for anything with, an, uh, with any other power. x squareds, any other power under there, this rule does not apply. So we will obviously try to trick you in that case. All right. Now this just says the bracket stays the same. So I want you to highlight that this bracket stays the same. So I've got the bracket ax plus b to the power of, now you just picked this up last week, if it's brand new to you, it's back again. You have to add 1 to the power, you have to divide by the same number, but there is one extra number in there. Where is that A coming from? Have a look at where A was in the question, and I want you to highlight that A is coming from, now you could call it the coefficient of x. If you want to put it in words, I'll put it down as coefficient of x. So where is that a going to be? Watch out, and if you've got highlighters, I would suggest when we do these questions, you highlight where the a value is coming from, because without a doubt, people will forget it. And you multiply the a value by, normally you put the number n plus 1, so whatever that power is, that number appears at the bottom. So your job is to make sure that the bracket stays con um, intact, it, what's inside the bracket does not change. You add 1 to the power, you divide by that number, but there's an extra number in there, so you're going to be doing that. Now I'm about to fast forward through a whole lot of proof that Dave put in the lecture, so we don't need it because we've got a lot more happening. So if you want, you can play the video and then you can slow it all down. But all it is is how did we get this, all right? And at this point, we've got a few um, examples to work through. This one has been worked for you. It's on your page. I'll just point out the obvious. So when you see this, do yourself a, a bit of a mental check and say it's linear. 4x minus 7 is linear. So when I go to put that into place, it says that it will become... The bracket stays the same, 4x minus 7. I add 1. I divide by the same number. However, 
I've already got that. I've sort of got it prepped. There is a number that needs to be multiplied by 6. And that number came from the coefficient all right, of x. It's the derivative of x, in fact. It's the same thing. So it turns out to be a 4. And I've got a plus c. Would you ever expand that? No, you don't need to. You need to tidy it up, perhaps. And you can see that the answer has been given to you as 4x minus 7 to the power of 6 on 24 plus a c. All right? So that's what we want to put into action. Now, Dave has got all this, but where does it come from? I'm about to flip through it all. It's just a proof of how it was derived. You won't get asked about how it was derived. Okay? You just need to know the examples. So here are your lecture examples. This is a bit of a revision for your quiz this week. What do you have to do first? Is it ready to be, um, to be in integrated, to be? You have to do your indices. And that means that you're saying to yourself, this is not ready. So I like the way we're thinking. I hope that on your quiz day, you are also thinking the same. So first job I've done is put the same bracket to the power of a half, because I know my indice rules. Dx. So now I'm about to implement this rule. It said, please keep the bracket as is. You don't change the bracket. You add one. Now this is again where it says a half. I will add one. I'm getting a 3 on a 2. I'm going to show my 3 on 2. And I sort of automatically do it like a bit of a backfill. I just put the times and I make sure I check what that number is. So I, the number is going to be a 3. I never leave it like that. You will lose marks in your quiz this week if you do not tidy up from that point there. So if you need to, this answer down the bottom, 3 times 3 on 2 is actually a 9 on 2. So then you are dividing by a 9 on 2 and that means, so I'll just put here that this would be a divided by a 9 on 2 and what that does is it flips, it does the reciprocal so it's a 2 on 9. This stays up here, 3x plus 4, to the 3 on 2 plus c. Now we accept that answer. You are not forced to go further. You don't have to in this question. But remember what I said. When we then put our values, limits, on our integrals, it is often easier to convert this one. So there is no problem if you want to take it further, which is... 2 on 9 stays there. This is the square root of the 3x plus the 4. And you have to cube that. Your choice is you want the cube under, you can, or I tend to put the cube on the outside. But remember, that little manoeuvre there is more useful when you're substituting numbers, but does not have to be done. That's round one. Have a look at question two in the lecture examples. I can tell you where most people will make the mistake, even on this week's quiz. All right, it's our understanding of the fraction that is there. So the integral says 2 over. Now I'm just going to put one line in because, again, people tend to not understand that this is 2 lots of a 1 on the cube root of a 5 minus a 7x. Now for some reason our brains can't see that that is a 2 being multiplied by a 1 on, which means that this should be a 2 bracket, 5 minus 7x to the power of, and again, it's your indices coming in, there's a 1 third somewhere, but there is a minus involved because it was a 1 over. So it's a minus 1 third, and I'll put dx. Now all I've done there is, before I've even done the integration, it's your indices. If you need to put that on your resource sheet, then do so, because you are obviously needing that to get through the next step. Now, how's your adding 1 going? Okay. Now, that 2 can sit there. It can also come out, so there's no problem if you want to move it out because it's a constant. So this is what ends up happening. I do have the 2. I have this bracket. It has to be add 1 to that index. When you add 1, I'm getting a 2 thirds. And I'm going to do my usual, which is put the two-thirds there, backfill, which means I've got a times, and I've gone to say, as well as, what's the number that has to appear? The number has to be the coefficient of x, which is a minus 7. Now, with all that sitting there, 
Where will people make a mistake? If you write that down, you've got most of your marks. It's the tidying up. It's this 2 that's over a minus 7 times 2 thirds. That's the part that gets... So if you think that's the potential on the calculator, do the number part to it. What I'm about to do is I'm about to say it's 2 over. This is a minus 14 on 3. So I'll come back and do a bit of a backfill. To me, this is 2 times, and I put minus 3 on 14. So what I've done there is I've just dealt with the numbers. I know the bracket is not going to change, so I left it there. I dealt with this 2 over, but as I said, if you want to do it on a calculator, if you think you're unsure, then trust the calculator as long as you push the right things. And I'm going to get an answer, and again tidied up. This should be minus 6. So it's a minus 6. Sorry about that. It's a bit too long, that fraction line. 7x to the 2 thirds, and I'll put my plus c over here. Can it simplify? 2's go into it, so you could have gone into uh, at some point. This goes down, dividing by 2. This goes down. And would I bother changing that bracket, I'd probably leave it because again we're finding that people are just just in a rush all the time in their quizzes so it's not essential you get your marks if you leave it like that as well. You get all the marks if you leave it like that. So it's a minus 3 on a 7 and you can put that as a fraction on its own as well. Third one down the bottom. Again, where do I think the problem occurs? The problem occurs because people don't understand that this is a 1 over, okay? So I'm about to say it's a 1 over, but my eyes have caught... Um, yep, no, that's okay. It's a 1 over. So this is what I'll do. This is where I think most people don't understand that the dx is sitting on top of a 1, if you want to think of it like that. So being able to push that dx, because sometimes it's a small detail like that that puts people off. So this has to be rewritten as a 1 plus a 25x, and this is to the minus 2. Can I still implement that rule? I can, because what's inside is linear. So the rule says, I'll get it ready, bracket stays exactly the same, and I add 1, and I also divide by the same number. I do this little backfill. So I'm saying to myself, don't forget there's also another number you have to check. It's a 25. Can you rewrite that? Can you make it any nicer? Again, there's a minus 25 on the bottom. If you want, you can either have it as there is a bracket 1 plus 25x to the minus 1 on minus 25. Or I'll put here, if you would like to, and then this is what, it takes people's time and it also is where people might make their mistake. Because that's to the minus 1, it means that that bracket is living in the denominator. So there is a 1 there. It can also be written like that. It's got to the power of 1. You don't need that. Yep. Go back to your formula at the top of page 41. So see the original has an N. See the new line on the right-hand side has an N plus 1 in the power. And it has an N plus 1 in the denominator. It has to be exactly the same number. That's a good point to make, so just keep an eye. That's why I don't actually, I don't do the multiplication all in one because I'm really checking if that number is the same as that number. So that's me checking on myself that I should see the same number appear. Whether it's a negative or a fraction, I sort of make sure that even though I know this is going to be an easy number to multiply, I still write it down like that, okay? All right, in yours, we're turning over. Now, we have to add a bit of information on this page because somehow it got forgotten. And it's a slide in here, but it's not on your page, so I'm about to inform you of it. Air is enclosed by the y-axis. Now, first of all, I think it's the language. People aren't sure when people say, I'm about to give you a curve, and I would like the area that is enclosed by the curve the x-axis is often what they say. And people aren't sure about what that means. So first of all, what's going to come back? 
a lot of graphs from first semester. Without the graphing skills from first semester, you will not find your limits that are going to be needed. So don't think I supply them all the time. So last week, when you did your integrals, okay, your definite integrals had little numbers on them, okay? And you were taught how to go ahead and find the definite integral. We need that knowledge, but what makes this slightly harder is you have to find the numbers some of the time. Some of the time it's obvious we will hand it to you, and some of the time you have to find it. How? Because you've got to be good at your one, two, four graphing skills. So we're about to find out how good you are at your graphing skills. Okay? So here's what it says. When y equals f of x, okay, does not cross the x-axis between this value a and this value b. So have a look at the picture. When your curve is floating above and it does not cross the x-axis, when it is above, what we're saying is we want the area that is enclosed by the curve, this value of x and this value of x, and the x-axis. So it's limited you to this shape. Now, it's not quite a trapezium because it sort of looks like it, but the top's got a curvy part to it. And our job is to find this area. And it has been found that the area can be located, can be evaluated, if you find the integral from A to B, so these are going to be X values down here. So I'm just going to add that because sometimes people, as we move along through today, are never sure is it an X value or is it a Y value I'm putting there because it's going to change. So I put the little extra X equals A and X equals B up the top. You know it's going to the X axis. Now I'm sort of stressing to you how I think. Because when it's written for you, you can see what it ends up as. But what you want to do is say, when someone has asked you for an area that is enclosed by the x-axis, then what you should see here is dx, because you are taking it in relation to the x-axis. And our next problem is what sits here. What sits there is the function, okay, f of x. And how will it be given to you? Quite often it's given to you as y equals, and it tells you what the function is. So when you look at your, up on top you can see on page 42, it's got it written with f of x, which is true, and then it says, but quite often it comes to you as y equals. Now here's the situation you have to understand. You have put that this will be with respect to x. So, it's saying, I know I need y, but what I want you to do is a substitution. Instead of the y, I want what it is equal to. So, the f of x, okay, meaning it's given to you as a function of x, gets substituted into that position. All right, gets substituted into that position. So, what ends up happening is you end up with x's here. You are meant to then end up with x's because you cannot integrate with respect to x if you still got a y there. So it gets placed, but then it gets removed and substituted. Okay? So what we're going to do is, and then the absolute values are there. They're not always needed. Some people play it safe and put them there every single question. But here's what I'll tell you. It's wise to do that. If you want to do that, by all means, you can. However, what you want to say to yourself is this. Can you see the area that you are talking about? And I'll say that again. Can you see the area you are talking about? If the area is above the x-axis, if the area is above the x-axis, I expect a positive answer. So there would be no need to put the absolute values around it, can I put them in? Of course you can. You'll be taking the absolute value of a positive number. It isn't going to change. What is crucial is that if your area ends up being underneath, so if, for example, and it's going to pop up, we will get a question like that, you can see that that is under. So what I tend to tell people is, I would still go ahead and do my integral. 
I am not surprised if I get a negative number because I'm supposed to actually get a negative number for this position and then the absolute values will come back and I will say, oh, that's right, I was meant to get an absolute value happen here because I could see that the area was going to give me a negative integral answer. So sometimes people jump in with their absolute values a bit too fast and they want to absolute value everything. All right, and I think that's a bit excessive. So rather than that, have a look at it as we go through these couple of questions you've got. Have a look at do you think the answer should come out negative? Because if you say, no, no, the area is above, then you should never get a negative answer. People think just because I've given you these absolute values, you can go and plonk them anywhere. But you've got a problem because if you get a negative answer, and you are staring at an area that is above the x-axis, something has gone wrong in your calculation is what that's telling you. All right, so I just want to stress that. Now, what happens is there is another... I'm going to come back to this slide because what I want to do is just go through the first example right there that's drawn for you. So your job is to say, how did that diagram come about? Because if you read the question, it says... Find the area enclosed by y equals x squared minus 5x plus 6, sounds great, and the x-axis. What is it lacking? It's lacking the two values that x needs to be. This is where your graphing skills come in. Now you can see the parabola that's being graphed. You can see that what we've done is, on the left-hand side, we have gone about finding, when you put y equal to 0, you are finding the x-intercept. So if you want to write that down, next to it say, that's the first step I will need to take. Find the x-intercepts, which means put y equal to 0. Often there's some sort of factorising. So again, get good at your factorising. You can see that it gave two roots, is what it's called, or two zeros. One is at 2 and one is at 3. Now I'll reread re the question. Find the area bounded by this parabola and the x-axis. Now your job is to draw it, see these two numbers, and realise that the area I'm looking for is under the x-axis. So what would happen here is, I realise that if I forget my absolute values, I know that I will get a minus answer. But it would have been expected because the area was under the x-axis. So you can see that the notes have been done and they've got the absolute values all the way down. Okay? Now that's fine because you realise it was needed. Now I'm going to go to the first example that we have to fill in. So here it comes. Find the area enclosed by y equals x squared minus 2x minus 3. It gives you two values there, a 0 and a 3. Okay? And it says, and it says, and the x-axis. Now, these two here, again, I would say to you, do not assume, just because those two values are there, do not assume all of that area is above, all of it is underneath. Some of it could be above and some of it could be below. So your job is a quick sketch. So please don't ever think, oh, I'll just go automatically with the zeros and threes because you will get stung at some point. So here I go. I'm about to find my x-intercepts. I said before, bit of revision, put y equal to zero. Solve it, and while I'm solving it, I'm also going to factorise. So I can see the x squared minus 2x minus 3. I've got some x's. I'm factorising that 3, because I think it'll go like that. I think it's a minus 3 in one bracket and a plus, all right, in the other, plus 1 in the other. So it looks like the two values would be minus 1 and 3, Okay. So what's happening is this. I've got a parabola. It's a concave up. It passes through minus 1. It passes through 3. It's going to get drawn like this. And again, keep an eye on me. Check everything I do because I'm sort of also wearing new glasses. So I'm looking at it a bit fuzzy at the moment. All right. So keep an eye on me. So it was a concave up parabola. It just needed to find where it crossed the x-axis. Now, at this point, they asked you for x equal to 0 and x equal to 3. Now, what you can tell is that it's coming from here to here. 
So they want this portion of the graph. They want this portion of the graph. Now why do I need to graph it? Again, I'll stress, you need to see if all of it is above, all of it is below, or some of it above, some of it below. Every single time. Don't go jumping in and assuming things. Now we can see that's under. So do you think we need the absolute values? And the answer is, yeah, I do. I can put them in at the end if I want, but I also know that I will need them from the very start. So here it goes, from 0 to 3. This is you writing in the lecture. Example. It's got an x squared minus a 2x minus a 3 with respect to x. So remember what I said? The y value will sit in there. So I've substituted the y value. I have put x values, so if you want to check, these are x values because I'm going between an x equals 0 to an x equals 3 and it's being integrated with respect to x. Alright, so how good are you at your integrals? This is what it happens. It says you will have x cubed on 3 minus 2x squared on 2 minus 3x. I don't need... I don't need the plus C. I'm going from 0 to 3. I'll simplify these while I'm at it. I, I just crossed out the 2s. Now, again, we're trying to save time. Okay, We're in an exam. There's lots of options. Here's what has to happen. I can see I've got the absolute values around the whole thing. I need to substitute the 3 in. So here's what happens. First time I'm going to put it in, I'm going to put 3 cubed on 3 minus 3 squared. Remember, it's only the 2s have disappeared, and it's minus 3 times 3. And then it says minus, and then I'm going to put the second bracket in. Now, I'll just pause because Jacqueline might have caught me on something. Can you see a problem, Jacqueline? So this guy has to go up. The power goes up from 2 to 3, and that goes underneath. This guy's power is a 1, so it goes up by 1, and the 2 goes under there. Okay. But that 2 happened to be simplified with that 2, which was just coincidence that there was a number above it that could work with it. Now, again, here's my other bit of advice. You may be sitting there going, look, it's just a 0. It's not going to make a difference. It's not perhaps on this page, but there will be a time in this semester when it will hurt when you've got your trigonometry and your exponentials. So don't ever just go, oh, it's just a zero. It won't make a difference. So I will put it in and just go zero cubed on three minus zero squared minus three times zero. Now, when I go to push my calculator at this point, if I did not have, if I did not have the absolute values, okay, this is what I'll tell you you get. So I've got myself an answer of, I've got myself an answer of minus 9. Now, if I did not see that this was negative, I would look at the answer and go, that's a bit strange, why have I got minus 9? But I'm not concerned that it's minus 9, so I'm actually going to put it like that so you can see that it is a minus 9, and then your job is to say, oh yeah, that makes sense, it was under the x-axis, I've already put the absolute values in, or... If you get to this point and it's a legitimate reason to put them in, go back and put the absolute values all the way back up through your working and say the answer to this is 9. And because it's an area, I will put units squared. So that's how you complete it. Keep in mind, do, do I always have to put the absolute values? The answer is no, you don't. Right? But if you want to play it safe, you'll always put them in. I understand that theory as well. Now, I'm about to go back a slide or two because I need you to add something, and it might get squished on the top of page 42 because there's about to be a diagram where some of the graph is above and some of the graph is below. Jacqueline, what did you want to clear up? This one here? That too? That too? Okay. 
So you said there's a 2 somewhere. Yeah, just unit. Yeah, that's a unit squared. Okay. That's all it is, uh, Jacqueline. It's a unit squared. I must have put it up a bit high and you thought it was on the line above. So I'm about to go back and you're going to squish this in on page 42. So on page 42, this one appeared and it said total area is not always equal, okay? So in this particular case, look at the diagram. Total area will not be equal to the integral from 0 to b of f of x. So what I need you to draw on the top of page 42 is I need that diagram, just make it a bit of a curve, maybe it looks like a trig curve, put some of it on the bottom and some of it on the top. Now, if you did not sketch this curve, if you did not sketch this curve and you went straight to this because you thought it was smart, I'll just do the integral from 0 to b. What will happen is that an area that's at the bottom, which is negative, and an area that is at the top, which is positive, will merge, and depending on who's bigger, right, the answer will come out as a merged answer. That means if they're identical, like the one you're staring at now, if it's identical, they will cancel each other out. This area under is negative, this area above is positive, put them together, you'll get an area equal to zero, which does not make sense. An area equal to zero you know, does not make sense. An integral, if it was last week, I could agree, but this week it's an area. So if you jump in and make it the integral from 0 to b, then what's going to happen is they're going to sort of merge and you'll get a different answer. So your approach says you need to see that th some of it is above, so see how we've written area is from a to b. I realise that bit is above and it will be a positive number. However, I realise that the area underneath is on its own. From 0 to A, I've identified it to be coming in at me as a negative, so I will definitely need the absolute values around that. Now, I'll say this again. You cannot just go from 0 to B. Even if you think, can't I just put the absolute values around it? That's not going to help you through the question. So that's where it says here, total area will equal, so they've had to split it. Some of it is under and some of it is above. Now we're about to do an example that goes with this, but if you could put that on the top of page 42, right, squish it into that corner there and say, I need this idea because I've got to recognise that when I draw my diagrams, some of the area may be below and some may be above. So I've got to take them all right, in, in parts. I cannot merge them, otherwise the answer will come out incorrect. So are we ready to go? I've got to flick back. I've got to flick back because now I'm going to do the second example on page 42 because that one there, you guys start thinking. I'm going to flick in a, in a sec when I stop seeing the eyes go. Start asking yourself what are the x-intercepts for that, for that graph. I'll give you a clue. There are three, so if anyone's working on it, start finding me three x-intercepts. Almost there, I see a couple of eyes still looking up there. Raymond, you right? Jacqueline, are you okay with that? Yeah, just give me, I think that you're the only one with the eyes looking still up. And Asha, you're done, aren't you? You found me three x-intercepts, Asha? Good, keep drawing it, because I'm about to come as soon as Jacqueline says. Go. All right, so let me get back to this one. Here comes the second one. It's this one here. Now, Asher says he's found them. Let me just catch up to Asher because you're going to check on me, Asher. X-intercepts, you put Y equal to zero. I'm solving this. How do I know people can't do this? Because you got asked something like this in your first quiz somewhere along the line, and you're not very good at seeing that this had to have a factorise of a common factor first, and then a trinomial. So, Asher, have we got two numbers? I'm coming up, Asher, with that answer. So I'm getting three answers. One's a zero, because a lot of people forget that guy. One's a one, and one's a four. We agree? Yeah. All right. How's the diagram looking? That's the next bit. Do you remember me disco dancing? This is a cubic. 
Here's my zero, here's my one, here's my four. This is not the time to find me maximums and minimums and concavity. This is just a quick sketch. I know the disco dance goes from here, up, down, up. I know how it disco dance. There's zero, there's one, there's four. You are going to hurt in your exams, in your quizzes, if you can't draw. And if you can't draw, that's because you can't factorise. So think about factorising and drawing. Now, the question said, find the area enclosed by this and the x-axis. Oh, you mean this part and this part. That's what they've asked you for. Now, I can see part of it is above the x-axis and part of it is below. So here is one where I say, the area will be found. The first part is above, so I will quote, from 0 to 1 of this function. So it's going to take up a bit of your working out, so try to condense it a bit. That is the first part, which is positive. And then you want the second part. Now you know the second part. You can see the second part is under. So you need to see that that's going to need the absolute values around it. So here it goes again. It goes from 1 to 4. And then again, it's the same function. And then I have to set about doing all of that. Now, because we are time constrained, all right, because we are time constrained, and a lot of this manual stuff takes us a long time, I'm going to leave that question. I will then complete these, all right, and then I'll put these up so you can go back and see this slide. Is that okay? So you can then at home practice doing the integral part. So this needs an answer plus, and this needs an answer. Now, we have way too much to get through this lecture, so I will complete that at home and put it on Blackboard. Is everyone okay with that? You will try. I will try. We better get the same answers. All right? That's our check. Now, where can we come up with some shortcuts with this? So here's what's about to happen. It says odd and even functions. Do you remember them back in 124? All right, 124 said, you know it's even if it has, and it's called um, even, if it has the y-axis as an axis of symmetry. So not all functions are even. Just because they have an axis of symmetry doesn't make it even either. So how do I know? The definition said, as you can see, f of x equals f of minus x. But the diagrams that you come up with, because remember, you're going to be sketching these. You want to ask yourself, is it, does it have y-axis as an axis of symmetry? If the answer is yes, as can be seen in that example on page 43, then you say, guess what? I've got a shortcut to this. Because the left-hand side will be the same as the right-hand side, if and only if, here's the catch, if and only if, I want you to highlight these numbers here because we may also trick you. If those numbers are, when I say the same, minus 2 to positive 2, if it was minus 3 to positive 3, then you have yourself a shortcut because what it says is if you're going to get asked that, then you can just do 2 times one side. So if you're looking at the diagram on page 43, it's like saying, well, I can see they want it from minus 4 to 4. Well, I can see it's even. I will go two times the integral from 0 to 4. Remember, it only works, the shortcut only works, if you have the same numbers sitting at the bottom of the limit, one's negative, and at the top of the limit, one's positive. So keep your eye on that. So that example has been done for you. And as I said, it's all there. They've allocated this to be two times. They've changed this number at the bottom, so highlight it if you want to make it really obvious. It's no longer a minus four. And remember, if you haven't understood from last week, it's much easier to work with a zero than it is with a minus four. Now, if you want to, you can still keep the minus 4. If you don't see the shortcut, we will still come up to the same answer. It would just take you a lot longer, is all that saying. 
So when this one gets completed, it came out to be 42 and two-thirds units squared. Our job is to find this guy here, y equals 1 minus x to the 4, and the x-axis. Again, I need to sketch this because I don't have any limits. I don't know the number at the bottom. I don't know the number at the top. So can you give me a quick idea? It's an x to the 4. It's got an even power, so it's like a parabola. It's disco dancing which way, though? Because it's negative, it's going down. So this is what we've come up with. It's going to be going down, so it's like that, right? How can you check other things, other features? Go look for the x-intercepts. To find the x-intercepts, put y equal to 0. Now, here we go. 0 equals... Again, people are no good at solving problems where they go, well, what do I do now? If you don't remember that this has two answers, it is a positive one and a negative one, that's going to hurt your, your areas. So it's, a, it's an equation question that ends up hurting here. Not so much the calculus part, but it's the obvious find these numbers. This guy should have gone up and down like this. It should have been at minus 1 and 1. The question had said find the area enclosed by, so here it is here. Do you think it's even? Do you think it's even? I'm going to give myself a bit of a tick because I've checked that this is even because the y-axis is its axis of symmetry. So because I think it's even, I'll do two things. I will write the original. The area should have been the integral from minus 1 to 1 of this curve with respect to x. That's what it could have been. And you can still do that if you want. However, the shortcut is put two lots of and change the number so it's only going from 0 to 1. And still the same y value and we've got ourselves a calculation to be done. Now again, guess what? I'm going to leave that there. That's the setting up, but what's time consuming is the rest of this. So you and I, we will both go home and we will both do this, all right, so that we can come back and check between me and you, and you're going to send me emails and you're going to check up on me, okay? Now I've done the setup, all right? I've done the setup, which is I recognised it was even, there's a shortcut, I need two lots of. Now, if you turn the page over, it's very similar on the next page. It says, if you know it's odd, so again I'll read through, the definition of odd is f of x equals minus f of minus x. However, when you sketch this, if you see a diagram, as is on page 44, how can you see that it's odd? Put your pen on the origin of that diagram, put your pen on the origin, and say, does it have point symmetry? Point symmetry means if you spin the book around 180 degrees, because I can't do that up here with my laptop, it won't be effective, does it still look the same? And if it does, the answer is that guy was, was a, an odd function. So if you recognise it's odd, and the same thing happens, if you know this number and this number, are the same but one's negative and one's positive. So look on the diagram. The worked example has minus one on one, oh, sorry, minus two with my glasses, minus two on one side and two on the other. If you recognise that it is odd, have a look at the working out that would need to be done. It says there that you would have to identify some of it is under and some of it is above. Now, what's going to happen to those areas if you don't treat this separately? It says that your answer here will be zero. Now, I can tell you that without even doing any other calculus. If you know it's odd, if you know the number on the left is the same as the number on the right, that automatically tells you that the area that's under is identical to the area that's above, but because one's minus and one's positive, when you merge them, 
you will get zero. That's an absolute fact. You don't have to go through the whole lot of working to figure it out. So if you just jump in and try and go from, for example, minus 2 to 2 in that question, you know the answer will be zero, but that's not the area answer. So what you have to do is two choices. You have to recognise that there's a negative part, so you would go with absolute values, and there's a positive part, or the shortcut says you can do two times. So what that means is there is a shortcut involved. So you can put here, and you can write it um, up on that, see that space next to your box up the top of page 44? The shortcut says, yes, this would be true. You will get zero if you do it as one combined area. So the shortcut says you go two lots of from zero to A of F of X, and that's how you will make life a little easier if it's an odd function. So I'll just get that worked example up. It says here, you are most welcome to take this as... Uh, a negative area and a positive area, but you are smarter if you take the shortcut, so I'll put shortcut got brought in there, but I want you to highlight this one up here that says, if you try to do the area from minus 2 to 2, bang, it's going to give you zero automatically, and you'll have done lots of work, and then you'll go, why did I get zero from that answer, okay? So here's one for us. Okay, find the area enclosed by. So again, do you know what this looks like? So here we go. To find the x-intercepts, it says put y equal to 0. So here we go. 0 will equal 4x minus x cubed. It says that we will have an x which was common. My hand just made that go away. 4 minus x squared. Keep factorising. It's called a difference of two squares. Gives me three answers. So keep an eye on me. I'm getting two, zero, two, and minus two. Zero, two, and minus two. Disco dance for me. It's a minus x cubed. It is a minus x cubed. So remember, we may ask you to graph, and we may give you marks for the graphing because that is crucial to us. Now it's going to cross here, here and here, round about, just a quick sketch. It's got a negative x cubed, so it should be going from this quadrant to this quadrant. So for that to work, down, up, down, and it wanted minus 2 to 0 to 2. Can you see the area here? Can you see the area here? The question wants you to find that total area. However, if you don't see the shortcut, you will take a lot longer to get there. You may also get an answer of zero if you have not seen this diagram. So first of all, I've seen it. I recognise that it is odd. Okay, It is an odd function. So my choice is I'm going to take the shortcut. Here it goes. Area will equal two times the integral from 0 to 2, and you might say to me, can I take the other one because I want to be different to you? You are most welcome to, but that is under, and you'll need absolute values around that one. Be smart, take the positive guy, because you know you will have less things to worry about. The function is 4x minus x cubed dx. And again, under here I'll write, you could have taken it so that the area was the absolute value from minus 2 to 0 of this curve plus, and then I would write from 0 to 2. So anyone that wants to take that path, you are welcome to. Again, you will get the same answer. I've written it down so that it says I've identified part of its negative plus and I've identified part of its positive. Most welcome to. But can you see the shortcut? And can you see that you will go two times? What has changed? You identify that it's a 0 to 2. All right, that's occurring in there. All right, now again, I'm not going to finish that. You're thinking, boy, she's taking a lot of shortcuts today. Dave has made this lecture very heavy, and we need a lot of time for the second part. 
So I've got one more thing and then we've got ourselves a break. Okay. Again, I'll finish that. You check with me. We're both going to go away and do it at home. Okay. Last step before we take our break, which is air is enclosed by the y-axis. I want you to highlight that it says y-axis on page 45. I want you to highlight that this is now going to be a y value, this is going to be a y value, and this says do y. So first thing I will say, when I set these up, all right, I usually do this, that the area will be the integral from, and I put y equals, and I put y equals, because we may give you the x value of a point, but if the question has asked for the y-axis, you need y values to be substituted. So there's more tricks that we might throw at you. So they, I put that down just so it locks it in my head that when I return, they will be y values. I write dy there because it must now be changed. And what you were practicing last week was integrating with some different letters. So we put some t's in there and we put some u's in there. So we wanted to make sure you know how to integrate even if the letter changes. I will say to you, you want what x is equal to. Now this sounds unnatural because normally you put what y is equal to. Your job is to go back to whatever the equation was and say, I'm about to substitute whatever x is equal to. And what x is equal to must be a function of y. That's what it says at the very beginning. It says that it will be a function of y. So once you substitute, you won't have x's in there anymore. You should now have a lot of y's in there because you cannot go ahead with this integration if it does not have y's sitting in there. Have a look at the example. Find the exact area. So I already know there's about to be some thirds. It says the curve we might draw for you if it's an easier one. Oh, sorry, if it's a harder one, we might draw it, give you the easy ones. This one says y is equal to 1 over x squared. Now have a look at the diagram. It says from where y equals 1 to where y equals 2, and it's been stopped by the y-axis. So... If it does not say that, it says you could keep going and going and going. But we want you to stop right there. So we want that to be our barrier, and we want these two and this curve on the right-hand side. Now, a bit of a problem. We had positive and negative areas in our x-axis questions. If they're below the x-axis, we said they're negative. If they're above the x-axis, we said they're positive. Same thing happens here. These ones would be positive if they're on the right-hand side. And if you get something on the left-hand side, it would have been considered negative. So that's when you will need the absolute values. All right? So again, same problem's going to happen. These are trickier. We won't throw too many of these at you. But they can be asked. We tend to ask, we tend to be a bit nicer to you here because on these ones, we don't tend to make some of it above and below, left and right. We don't tend to make it like that, because it already is a harder idea. So have a look, because it says, I realise that I want this area, so it says I would like the area, all right, that comes up, what I'm about to do is, I want this guy here. So I would say the area from 1 to 2, these are y values, and I'm just checking, I would write my dy. My problem is what sits there. Now, this is going to be the hardest part because what you need to understand, and you can write this in, please, from here, what is happening is you need to substitute something there, whatever x is equal to. But you go back to the question. It didn't hand you x equals. It handed you y equals 1 on x squared. So you need to say make x the subject. Please put that in a highlighted box for you to understand that you cannot, and we won't do it for you, you have to say, oh, hang on, go back, they gave me y equals 1 on x squared. My job is to make x the subject before I go there. 
Now it's these little details. It's semester one. Can you make x the subject? So have a look. This has been multiplied over, so it becomes x squared y. I got x squared by itself. When I took the square root, there are two answers. There's a positive and a negative. And you may say, why did we only take the positive? Because this side is the positive square root of 1 on y. This side is the negative of the square root of 1 on y. So if you're wondering why didn't we make this just the positive here in that position right there, because we're only looking at the right-hand side of this curve. Again, it's that that hurts. It's your indices. It's your getting your x as your subject. Again, I'm going to flip through because that's the answer. There was a clue it said exact, so you knew there was going to be some thirds. I'm going to set this one up. Okay, This is going to be set up. It is to the y-axis. So it says, please find me this. Do you recall what it looked like? Do you recall what it looked like from semester one? Any clues? Call out to me. It's a sideways parabola. Because the minus is in front of the y squared, it's sort of like saying it's not your first idea, but it's flipped over, which means on the y-axis it goes this way. So it's doing that. Now, how do I check if I'm right? A couple of things. This is what used to happen in 1, 2, 4. Substitute x equals 0. See what you get. Substitute y equals 0. See what you get. That's just an x-intercept and a y-intercept. Which is the easier one? This guy here, x should equal 1. That's why this guy here is x equals 1. If you put 0 in, you get yourself an equation that says this. And that means y squared should equal 1. So y should equal plus or minus 1. That's why there's a minus 1 there and a positive 1. Again... If you look at this diagram, it's going from minus 1 to 1. It is a y value. It is a y axis question. So again, I'm going to set it up. Here we go. The area should be... Now, I'm about to put the integral. I could have said from minus 1 to 1. Okay, so I will say from minus 1 to 1 of the curve and it's with respect to y. I've put dy there, and before I write anything there, it's an idea to say what's about to sit in there should be whatever x equals. Did we give it to you as x equals? Was x already the subject? If it was, then you say, right, I'm allowed to put that there. Is there a shortcut? Do you notice anything about this curve? Yeah, because it's an even function, even though it's a y-axis one, it's got the x-axis as its symmetry, so it's got the same on the top as the bottom. So this question is saying there is a shortcut, two lots of, from 0 to 1 of this curve. And again, that's my setup. I'm going to do the rest of that. It's the setups that hurt. It's that idea of what should I find, what numbers, where they're getting them from. How do you know it's two times? Because this curve here is an even, even though it's a y, okay, even though you think it's a sideways parabola, it can still be considered even. So there's a shortcut to be considered. Now we've earned ourselves a break. We still have quite a lot. So I'm literally going to say five minutes. Literally at 10 past, I will keep talking because we need to get through the rest of areas and volumes, okay? Rest of areas and volumes. <coughs>
go and check on the Dave group. So Justin, your surname is there. So Justin, Justin. So Justin, week zero, there's no redemption. Justin, it's, it's Hoken, is it? Yeah. I've only got one, I'm thinking. Um, there, I can see your mark for quiz zero, there's no redemption. And if Dave had it, he would have he would have done that one. Okay. Justin, I see your A1 quiz. Have you put a redemption? He is sick. I do know he's yeah. sick. And I think that might be a sign because Dave normally has it done yeah. like that. So I wouldn't be concerned. He has had a bad weekend. If he went to drop in today, he's quite Tuesday got ones, couldn't quite get the glass. There's that sweet spot, isn't it? Yeah. I just got sick of putting my pretty glasses on. I only need them. I can see most of them. Just that definition. Dave will have it. Yeah. Here you can go up there. Have you got anything? You can go get it now if you want. You know what I mean. Dave is up there permanently. I mean, he's. I don't think he's at anything. You know, like I don't think there's anything on today unless he's at a meeting. But you know where he lives up there. I'll tell you his room number in a sec. But if you want to go get it, you know, that way you can sort of start working on it. Um. Okay. We're ready to go. We have so much to do. As you can tell, I've taken a few liberties there, which means I don't normally like to leave you with no answers. I've set you up, and your job is to practice the uh, rest of the primitive work. I will complete them, and then I'll post them up. Okay. So here is what we've got. We are now up to 
What happens when life gets complicated, Kai? In lots of areas, but in this particular one, life is going to get complicated when they put two graphs on there. Now, there are two graphs. So here is, here is where you have to ask yourself a question. First question, Brendan, can I draw the two graphs? That's going to be one hurdle. Because if you can't place these, and, and we, we do usually make them fairly simple diagrams, okay? So what happens is, can I draw them? Can I find points of intersection? Now, I'm stressing that because that's first semester's work. Can you do some simultaneous equations? They're not usually going to be very hard, but it's still the fact that people don't know that their job is to say, when I draw these, I have to find the points of intersection. How do I do that? Oh, I do that algebraically. So I want you to stress to yourself that this is the same path over and over again. The, be the biggest hurdle, though, that you have to um, jump over is that sometimes you will be adding areas and sometimes you will be subtracting areas. So what I want you to do at this point, I want you to have page 48 and 49 sitting uh, open in front of you. I'm just going to look at the two examples that have been completed. What you can see on the left-hand side, first of all, they had to draw y equals the absolute value of x, a bit of a refresher course. That's a shape that has like a V in it, all right? So what ends up happening is they get the blue curve, which is on my uh, slide. They then draw the parabola x minus 2 all squared. So it's a parabola that's shifted over to, not a problem. However, what they notice is that there's two points of intersection, and they're the two things I need to find. So it says, and it's all worked for you, but I want you to put a really big this and highlight it, is you finding points of intersection. Put it in big words and say, this is you going and saying, for me to find the values of where these two graphs cross, and I can see two answers, so you better have two answers come out of this. So here's the next problem I find from last semester. I want you to highlight that when people do this particular equation, there's an x equals an x squared minus 4x plus 3. I want you to highlight this guy because it's a quadratic equation and you need that to say equal to 0, one side or the other. But what they've done is move the 1x over so they've subtracted an x, and that's why it's gone from minus 4x to minus 5x. So I want you to add any little hints you can, like please make sure this isn't equal to zero. This then factorises, it gives two answers, so you can go back to the graph and put the 1 and put the 4 there. Now, once you see it, and it's been drawn for you, it wants th that area... But the problem is that when you get asked that area, part of the area is, tri is a triangle, which is this part here. Part of it is a triangle, which is that part there. And the right-hand side's got a curved to it. And when you realise that part of it is under the blue straight line and part of it is under the curved red parabola, and it's that part that you want to say, even though they've written it there for you, put down, see how it says A1 plus A2? That's you recognising that one part of the curve will come from under the straight. This is the guy here coming under the straight line from 0 to 1. The value is x dx. And then this part is going from 1 to 2, and it's got under the parabola little hint for you because you may on this quiz coming up if you get given an x minus 2 squared you have two choices you can expand that because you can or you can use the rule that was at the beginning of today's lecture so there's two ways to deal with it and in the book they've dealt with it like today's lecture so this is linear check so I can use the shortcut version and that's why it comes up like that but if you expanded it, you get the same answer if you do all the right steps. So again, 
This is what ends up happening. That's the area. Now, our question that we've got to do, again, it's a bit of a speed. Here it goes. Find the area between. Now, quick sketches, quick points of intersection. First thing, what does this look like? First graph has y equals, it's a minus x squared, upside down parabola, gone up to 2. So the first one I want to draw does something like that, goes up to 2. At this point, I don't really know if I need those two other numbers, so I'll just wait to see. Where is y equals 1, and what kind of graph is it? Straight line. So here it comes, straight line, y equals 1. And it said it would like the area between that curve y equals 1 and the x-axis. So what would you be shading? It makes it interesting. What would you shade? It says travel from under the curve, then under the straight line, under the curve, and to the x-axis. So it's this part. All right? So first thing is, did you see that that's the part? Now, I'm going to have to make that slightly bigger so I can put some extra things on there. What extra things do I need? Well, wherever this happened, wherever that straight line hit the parabola, I need to know when that happened because can you see that this area is under the parabola then it goes under the straight line, or you might say it's a rectangle, which it is, and then you need this part, which is under the parabola again. Now, in my brain, I've set up my plan. I realise I need this number here and this number here. So I need to know the points of intersection. So here I go. Under here, I'll just remind you, these are points of intersection about to be figured out. As long as y equals... 2 minus x squared, as long as y equals 1, I'm putting them in a substitution. Move some things around. This is where you just need to be good at that. Are there two numbers? I get plus or minus 1. I knew that I was supposed to get plus or minus 1. So this number here, all right, this number here and this number here, this is a minus 1 and this is a 1. What else do I need to find that I haven't put on that diagram? Where the parabola hits the x-axis. See these two numbers? Because that's going to be part of my values as well. So where will you find that? So this one here needs to know its x-intercepts. How do you find x-intercepts? y equals 0. You just keep having to you know, remind yourself. Justin, can you see something I've done? Okay. I mean, there's so much happening, and I'm trying to do it very fast. I do apologise. Now, this one's going to give me two answers, and they're called thirds, people. You know thirds? Remember your thirds? They can pop up as well in this semester, and they're going to hurt if you don't remember what to do. This is a minus root 2. This is a positive root 2. Okay. Now, can you see the area you need? You need this small part portion. You need this portion. So I'll, I'll give it a squiggle like that. And then there's another small portion. It's a part here plus a part there plus another part. Think about any shortcuts. Any shortcuts you reckon can happen? I'm going to write it, and as usual, I'll set it up. Here it comes. I'm going to write it down here, guys, because my... Um, I just need a bit more space, I think. Let me just try and squish it in there. Here it goes. The one on the, from the left-hand side, it's going from minus the root of 2 to minus 1, and it'll be under the parabola. Under the parabola. So I'll put that there. I'll say this is under the parabola. You can take the middle guy as a rectangle or... You can do the integral, whichever one you think is a smart move. Who votes for the rectangle? I do. Do you know the length and the breadth of the rectangle? Do you know how, how long is it? You will convince me you knew the rectangle. How long is it? How high is it? Two by one. So if you want to do that, I'll put here 
This is the rectangle. You can do it either with an integral or you can just go 2 times 1 because it is just a rectangle you're finding. And then you've got the other guy which goes from uh, 1 to the square root of 2 underneath the parabola. So again, I'll put parabola up in this corner here. Now, remember, I would write that and then I'd say, you know what, I think there's a bit of a shortcut. I've got the rectangle under control. I think that those two bits on the side, they would be the same because I can see there's an evenness about this. So I could take a shortcut and just say that the area would equal the 2 times 1, which is the rectangle. I think it would be advantageous just to do two lots of... Now, that's not always the case, but in this one it is. So, you know, don't always assume. The main thing is you can see that it was area under the parabola, area under the straight line, area under the parabola. If you want to, call it A1, call this A2, call this A3. If that helps you, A1, A2, A3. A1 has got to do with the parabola, A2 has got to do with the straight line, and that's therefore why it gave me a rectangle, and A3 has got to do with the parabola. Now again, I've set it up. You and I will go back and we will finish that off, all right? There is the other version. So I said on top of page 49, two curves. I draw the two curves. I see a y equals x squared, pretty simple parabola. y equals x plus 2. I know that's a straight line. It's got a positive gradient and it's got a y-intercept of 2. I can see the two diagrams drawn. What I want you to do is to put right next to this that these two numbers here did not come out of the question but came out of points of intersection. So I want you to stress because you'll look back at this and say where did the minus 1 and 2 come from? They were never in the question. So remind yourself that you have to do points of intersection and how they did that was they made as long as one says y equals x squared, the other one says y equals x plus 2. They solved that, they got two answers. So stress to yourself, there's a lot to happen here. It then says, on the top of that example, it says, when I notice the area that is between the parabola and the line, you see what's been shaded for you? Now, this is not a sum of areas, but a subtraction of areas. So here's what I want you to highlight to yourself. See the two points of intersection that you come up with. Highlight them in your mind. Can you see that the area, okay, is within the same two limits? So what I mean by that is put your sort of hands on minus 1 and 2. So the curve I'm looking for, the area, sorry, I'm looking for, is between those two numbers, and then ask yourself which curve is above when you are, and I want you to just zone out except for the minus 1 to 2, because that's the only part you want to look at. So you want to just ignore this, and you want to ignore this and say, for where I'm zooming in on, from minus 1 to 2, which curve is on top? Which curve? The straight line is. The line is always on top, it never changes. So what that allows you to set up, and you can see on the top of this working, it says, I will be doing an integral from minus 1 to 2 of the line minus the same integral from minus 1 to 2 of the area under the parabola. But we've realised that if your limits are the same, then what that allows you to do is to write it as one integral. So I want you to stress at the top of page 49, they are actually two areas. The area under the straight line, take away the area under the parabola. By the way, what that means is, if you take the area under the straight line, it would give you a trapezium like that. If you take away the area under the parabola, that's this part, and this part. And that's why it leaves you with that part shaded in there. Now, if the limit numbers, if the numbers are the same, you're allowed to combine it. So it says, I only need to do one integral from minus 1 to 2, 
and I've put this is the straight line minus and this is the parabola. Now, the rest of that's worked. We're going to do the example. Again, I'm going to set it up for you. Here we go. Do you recall what y equals x squared looks like? Hope so. That's the easy one. That's that one. y equals x squared. Do you recall what y equals the square root of x looks like? Semester 1. Recall. What's it doing? It's... It's a sideways parabola, but I only want part of it. So what it was, was it was a sideways parabola, but I only want the top part, and I want that part there. Now again, the area between these is that part there, so I can actually see what they want. But again, I think there are two points of intersection that need to be found. So here we go points of intersection and I'm stressing this part you'll notice that I'm doing this part because this is the part we're really bad at our one two four equation work so here we go as long as it says y equals on both of them so this is a substitution that is occurring so one said y equals x squared one said y equals the square root of x what do we do next this is the problem I have with you with the students as such what to do next? No illegal moves, no red card moves. Square both sides would be a bit of advice. Why do you want to square both sides? Because this needs to come out to be an x. And when you square this, what do you get is the question. I get x to the 4. I've got that. Now, these are the small details from first semester that people aren't getting right. So it says, can you solve that? x to the 4 minus x should equal 0. There's a common factor. And this guy gives me 0. And this guy gives me a positive 1, which was what I was supposed to find. Two answers. One's at 0, that's handy. And one's at 1. So, Points of intersection are going to create problems because we find our equation work is not up to scratch. That leads you to horrible numbers which lead you to this horrible rolling mass of errors. Okay? Guess what? Go between 0 and 1. So focus in just between 0 and 1. Which curve is on top and does it stay on top is the question. So which curve stays on top? This guy here, which is the, sort of call him the half parabola. So this guy here is the y equals the square root of x. So I will put, the area will be, are they going between the same numbers? 0 to 1. The top curve is actually this, and I'll write it down. Take away the bottom curve, which is this. So what I'll do is I'll remind myself that this is the top curve, this is the bottom curve, and you'll notice I say, when you are between 0 and 1. What happens after the 1? Who goes on top after the 1? The parabola does. So be careful because that's what it's saying. When you have to zoom in on those two numbers, block everything else out, what curve is on top and does it stay on top? Because there's always a place where they cross over and then the other one will be on top. Am I going to finish this? What do you reckon? No, I'm going to set it up for you though. And the setup only involves t turning that square root of x, turning that square root of x into an x to the half. All right. Areas. Okay, you ready? That's areas. Areas to the x-axis, areas to the y-axis, areas between two curves, Depending, you'll be adding or you'll be subtracting. Lots to practice in the tutorial, lots to practice on the worksheet. You can see that a question in a quiz can take a long time because there's so much to set up. So, we turn and now we say the other application of this integration is also volumes. Volumes you get when you have a 3D shape, not a 2D shape. You need a three-dimensional shape. So on the top of page 50, you can see something like this. And it just goes through, and again, I'm going to just jump straight to the, the, the examples. It says, 
I'm going to have some sort of curve, and I'll just stress that this was the curve up here. I didn't quite catch it, so I'll just do what you guys do and make it bigger and fatter like that. So that was the curve, and this is the language that they will use. They're taking a curve, and they're going to either rotate it about the x-axis, or they will rotate it about the y-axis. So first thing, x-axis. You're going to rotate a curve, right? can be straight, it can have like curves in it like that. Rotate it around the x-axis, and if you imagine it to be, imagine it to be some sort of, you know, I don't know, <laughs> big amount of jelly or something, and you take a curve and then you go rotating it, what it's going to do in there is it's going to form a shape. You can think of it in timber as well, like that's how they end up making these things on their machines. So that what you're saying is you're taking what's just a two-dimensional sort of a curve and you're going to then rotate it and it'll come out giving you a shape. This one looks like, you know, those drums, that particular, that particular shape you're staring at there ends up looking like, you know, those drums, like an African drum type of thing. So... You've got to say, oh, I can see the three-dimensional shape. So, what do you do? These are a couple of things I'd highlight if I was you. Volumes that go rotating about the x-axis. What I tend to do is do a big rotate. See that little that curve I've just done there? I tend to remind myself if I'm rotating about the x-axis, my formula will start with pi. It will have a dx here. So this is me writing the formula. It's written there. But this is me writing it if I'm remembering it. You will have it on your resource sheet, but just so you can save some time. If you are rotating about the x-axis, I draw this little shape here. I put pi, I put this has to be an x value, this has to be an x value. Here's the part that hurts. What sits in here is not the y value anymore, but y squared. So what gets put here has to be the answer to what is your y squared answer. So it's got it there. It's written it again with the f of x notation. And our job is to do that. First thing, read if it's to the uh, being rotated about the x-axis or the y-axis. Read or, in, in, or read your resource sheet or remember. Pi, the pi out the front. Integral from x equals a number to x equals a number. It's got to have dx at the end. And when I bring my substituted guys in, it better be the answer to y squared. So I'm not going to go through the rest of that slicey business there. It's lovely, I know, but it's just putting a formal proof to it. And again, you can slow the video down, <laughs> all right, and see it in slow-mo. On the top of page 51, what we've got, is it's already worked but I want you to highlight a couple of things find the volume of the solid generated when this area between a curve called y equals x squared plus one so they've drawn this parabola for you x equals one pops up and x equals two so they've given you the x values and the x-axis so I'm going to do this so it reminds me of a few things find the volume when you rotate this area this ends up looking like, now how would you describe this shape? To me, you remember when you used to see uh, animals at a zoo that stand on, you know, like those little platformy things? To me, it reminds me of one of those. Is there something else you can sort of associate this one with? A sideway dish, but it is a solid. It's not, it's not hollow, it's a solid. So it looks like it wants to be like a, a fruit platter type thing, but it is completely full. All right. It doesn't matter if you can't see it, but some people it helps to visualise it. Now, they only want this part from 1 to 2, and it was going around the x-axis. So this is me writing. I know it's already written there. If I was going to start this, I'd put v equals pi. I put this, and I remind myself they have to be x values. I remind myself it has to be with respect to x. And I remind myself, do not go in here unless you know what y squared is. Now, you can see there that it's been done for you. So you'll say, where did they get the first line from? 
They got the first line because they knew that the curve was y equals x squared plus 1. So you'll see me write that under my solutions. And then I ask myself, well, what is y squared? Well, if you square the left-hand side, you better square the right-hand side. So that is why the very first line of their working appears, and you'll see that line there. Now, where's the next, pot next potential error? The next potential error is if you think the rule at the beginning of today gets you past that. Does the rule at the beginning of today let you get past that? No, because what's inside the bracket is no longer linear. So this is a question forcing you to expand. No way around it. You have to expand it so that you get all of those values, x to the 4 plus 2x squared plus 1. That then gives you the go-ahead to find the integral. Now, it's all worked out. One thing I want you, want you to highlight and point out, you leave pi where it is. Do not go into any sort of decimal approximation. So we will say leave pi because it will say exact value. And when somebody wants an exact value, you can't see that word there, we'll take him out, exact value, it means leave the pi, leave the thirds, leave things like that alone. Do not go to that calculator. So you see the pi has not been touched. They've figured out the rest, and then they've given it together, and they've given units cubed, because now it's a volume. Are you ready for the one we've got to do? Here it comes. Find the volume generated when the area between... Now, we've seen this curve before. So what is your reaction to this? Where, where is this curve? It's part of a parabola, but it was only the top half, so it was this guy. So there is part of my curve, the x-axis, and the number x equals 20, so I put in x equals 20. Rotate it about the x-axis, and I remind myself like that. So it wants that part of the curve rotated. Can you see what kind of shape this one will give you? This one will give you sort of like, like a glass, but it's completely full inside. It's not hollow, okay? It's completely solid inside. Now, you don't have to draw the other part if you're saying, I'm not going to spend time on that in an exam. I just know it's a volume, and it's going about the x-axis. So this is how I start my question. It says pi times the integral from x equals, and I've set it up. I'll come back to those values. And remember, the question wants me to make sure that before you go in there, you better know what y squared is. Now, I can write y squared in there for you, right? But it's about you understanding. It will be y squared, but you've got to make sure you know what it is so you can bring it in. Now, this is what I would like. Pi, it's going from 0, because that's where it started, to 20. Do I know what y squared is? Well, on the side here, I tend to say, well, if I started with that, no, I don't know what y squared is yet, but I'll square both sides. So y squared is equal to x. <coughs> I now know what y squared is equal to, so I'll put x dx. Now, I'm going to finish this one off because it's a short one. Pi, it's got x being integrated goes to x squared on 2 from 0 to 20. How you come up with this is up to you. I'm putting the 20 squared on 2 minus the 0 squared on 2. That should come out to be, I think, a 400 divided by 2, but check on me. And a 400 divided by 2 should give us, I'm pretty sure, a 200 pi. And then you put the units cubed at the end. Don't touch the pi. See if you can do things like, you know, faster in your head. But don't panic if you have to use your calculator, except don't push the pi component in, okay? Now, there's another one around the corner, up the top. We're almost there. What well, could lay, make life harder again? If the volume that I'm spinning is between two curves, just what I wanted. I wanted an area, and then I need to um, rotate that. So here it comes. It's got this um, curve again, which is the parabola, y equals x squared. What does a y equals a half x look like? 
What kind of curve is it when I say the word curve? What kind of function? No, straight line. Oh, it's just a straight line. This guy is just a straight line going through the origin. It's got a positive gradient, so it looks like that. Now, mine's pretty small in there, but the area that I want is this part. So again, here I go. I can see two points of intersection. People who do not draw don't open up the right doors because once I draw this, I can see that I will need some points of intersection. I can tell one zero. That part's easy. But it's the other guy that we don't know. We don't take guesses at it. I don't tend to. Points of intersection. This is a substitution. As long as one says y equals and the other one says y equals, we're ready. Can you solve this? What would I do? I tend to multiply by the 2. And then I tend to bring everything on one side because it's quadratic, so it needs an equal 0. Factorise. And it appears as though there's an answer of 0, which I was hoping for. And it appears as though the other one is a positive a half, which suits my picture. This suits my picture nicely because I was expecting a positive number. All right, so what ends up happening here, okay, is you actually have to break this one down. So when you think about the volume that's about to happen, it's going to really be the volume that is created by the straight line, the volume that is created by the straight line. So I will say, I will say, oh, all right, then don't go away, volume equals pi from 0 to a half and I'm going to say y squared dx and I'm going to say this one is the volume from the line and then it says minus and then I need to find the volume that would have been created under the curve okay so this is volume oh I don't want the v there pi from 0 to a half of whatever y squared is in that one, dx. But this one, when I go to create it, is the parabola. So, what you have to do is find the volume if you only had the straight line, the volume if you only had the parabola, and then do the subtraction. So this one gets a little harder because... When I go to ask what this y squared is, so this is this guy, uh, sorry, this is the straight line, this is the line here. So y squared would be a half x squared, which is x squared on 4. So that means the volume will be pi times the integral from 0 to a half of x squared on 4 minus pi times from 0 to a half. I need the volume if I was only looking at the parabola. That's this guy here. So y squared would be x to the 4 because you square both sides. So again, I need all of that. Now there is one place I could take a shortcut at this point. I could take a shortcut at this point. And that is because they both have a pi, because the integral is going from 0 to a half for both of them, then I could merge this and say this is pi from 0 to a half of this volume, take away this one, because they were both going from 0 to a half. Now, I'll just put a, a little pause on that and say be careful don't go and do that the straight line, which is half x, minus the parabola, which was x squared. Don't go and square that difference because you will end up with a different answer. So what I had to reinforce with you is take it as the volume of the one coming from the straight line, from that rotation. Take it as the volume coming from the curve and then do the subtraction. Now guess what? I'm going to leave that one. 
so we can keep working on what should be our very last thought, which is volumes about the y-axis. So just bear with me and highlight the crucial parts. Because you are going about the y-axis, again, what I will stress is this is how I write it. I know it's already written for you, but I want you to highlight that when you go to quote this, this will now be a y-value, this will now be a y-value, this will say de y, and what gets placed there should be whatever I believe x squared is equal to. Now, it's written there on page 52, all right? And what they've got, they've got a worked solution. So I want you to get that highlighted part and say, make sure that what goes there is the answer to what is x squared. Now, here's what happens in the worked solution. It starts with y equals x cubed. There it is there. It's a cubic function, the most simplest cubic that we could draw. So it says between that, the y-axis, the line y equals 1, and the line y equals 8. So it's about to pop in. They take that area and they rotate it. Okay. Now, again, you don't have to see the actual 3D shape, but it's about just noticing that when you start this question, you go y, you need a y value here and a y value here. And before you can set off, make sure you know what x squared is. Now, this one's a tricky one because, again, this is really just one, two, four revision because you look back at what was given to you. It says y is equal to, the, to x cubed. And I said you need to bring in what x squared is equal to. Now, a lot of people find that hard to make x squared the subject when you've got y is equal to x cubed. Now, I know it's worked there, but I just want you to realise that what you're doing is making x the subject first by taking the cube root of both sides. That's already written down for you. That is also written as y to the one-third. And then ask yourself, do you know what x squared is? Square the left-hand side, square the right-hand side. Are you good at your indice work? Because that's what gets placed into that example. Now, it's all those minor details that are going to cost you some marks. So think about that. I will do a completed... You can see why I had to keep doing that, because... You know, I've only really got five minutes to spare, and if I'd spent time on all of the nitty-gritty, we wouldn't have got to the end. I will complete all the nitty-gritty, all right? I will put it, you check me, I'll check you, whatever, all right? And make sure that you do practice, whether it be in the tutorials, uh, with the worksheets, and then they're going to be the rest of these questions. Remember, you don't have a textbook. This is your textbook. So anyone who is not looking at that textbook pays the price because when I write the quizzes, I look at our textbook, which is this guy, and I look at the worksheets, and I sort of do a bit of both so that I sort of say anyone who's done everything will be at an advantage, okay? If you've done both the worksheet and your homework from this, which is like your textbook, you'll be at an advantage. So that's it. We got there? This week was hell. This week was hell. We will put, Dave, what were you thinking? There we go, Dave. What were you thinking? And I was jumping through some of the formal proofs that he put in there. They were beautiful diagrams, I'll have to tell him. But what was he thinking? And that's me trying to point out the main bits. If you've used your highlighter, you'll keep saying to yourself, the main things are drawing, po points of intersection, which you're really not good at, and I say that as a general, I love you all, but you're not very good at equations, so you need to get better at it. Come to drop-ins and solve all those little nitty-gritty questions like that. Otherwise, make sure you're turning up to everything as best as you can. Don't let too many tutorials go past and not do those quizzes. Anything else you want to know? I'm about to tell you that. 
I will tell you that. Just hang on a second. <laughs> it's going to be MC, G, which means it's not the lower ground. Right? And then when you go up, um, it'll be something like, I'm going to take a guess. Does it have his name on the door? Yeah, it does have his name on the door. Um, so you go up those stairs, it'll be left. So um, do you know where... Kevin's office is. Yep. Not Kevin's side, go the other side of the stair, oh. down the so other side. The right hand side is the left. Sure. Yeah, it's on the door. Yeah, it's on the okay. door. Try about a 39. That rings a bell for okay. some reason. And that's what happened to you yep. the other day. All right then. And does it have to happen every week? Do you mean? For the near future. Um, I, I do leave fairly early in hopes that I will get back in time. So it, it, it might happen again? It might just be that yeah. tiny bit. Yeah, that's okay. Um, because the third... That's okay. And then what could have happened was you could have just tried Friday's tutor with Dave. Or, yeah. or what could have happened was you could have just gone, because Dave will sit you in his office for 20 minutes. So if you, I know you don't realise that because you think, oh, it's probably you know, not going to happen. But if ever that happens, Dave's uh, full time. So he will always be there. So what that means is, even if I've got other things, he, in the McMullen, yeah. And what that means is, even if not straight away at 11, we both do have shoots um, at that time. But he'll say, look, come back, just give me an hour, come back, you've got 20 minutes, he'll sit you down in his office. Okay, just keep that in mind, you know. Um, yeah, if that happens, or you could come back on Friday for the whole of his shoot. If that yeah, has to happen all the time. Yeah, why not? Yeah, and I know you're going to try, but again, you don't want to com compete with the traffic. 
you know, if it's if it's not life or death type. Well, I would try. Yeah. Yeah, and I know what you mean. It, it, it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a major road that one coming across. So thanks for telling me. Yeah, and then keep that in mind. Yeah, and as I said, even if you do, or even if you are more late, I I will then go from that room. I go next door for another hour, and then I do drop in. But even I would say, just come on in and sit down for 20 minutes. You know, if it's, if do you have other lectures on? On, on that Thursday, do you then have to pass yes, it at an hour after? Yeah, so we try yeah. to work something out between it, you know? We would try to work something out. So, yeah.